Saturday afternoon, an assistant professor in the Department of Endocrinology, Diabetes, and Metabolism here at Mount Sinai. She received her medical degree from University College Dublin and her PhD in Physiology and Medical Physics from the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. Dr. Adler completed an internal medicine residency as well as a fellowship in endocrinology in Dublin. After which she moved to Mount Sinai in 2007 where she completed a research track residency and joined the endocrinology fellowship program. She was appointed assistant professor in endocrinology in 2012 and subsequently received a KOA from the National Cancer Institute to study the role of hyperlipidemia and breast cancer progression in preclinical models. She received a Tisch Cancer Institute Junior Scientist Award in 2016 to study the role of oxysterols and inflammation in breast cancer models. In addition to her preclinical research, Dr. Gallagher is spearheading a, a clinical oncoendocrinology clinic at the FDA and Camp Diabetes Clinics. These clinics are dedicated to treating and issues and complications that arise in patients with cancer. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gallagher. So good morning. I hear there was just a code, so um, I guess a lot of people are busy. Um, so um, it's uh, my pleasure to talk to you today about the, um, a lot of what I do in research and also in um, the clinic, which is basically looking at the links between cancer and diabetes, both um, how diabetes is related to cancer and then basically how cancer uh, treatments affect diabetes. I have no disclosures. So um, this is essentially the vicious cycle, which is... Um, basically the links between diabetes and cancer. This part of it here, the diabetes medications and how they're associated with cancer, both good and bad, I'm not going to discuss today. Um, but essentially then there's a link between cancer, cancer medications, and increasing the risks of diabetes. So the first part of the talk, I'm gonna talk about how diabetes affects cancer, both cancer risk and cancer mortality. So this um, is essentially the, the link between type 2 diabetes and different types of cancer. And so there is a very strong association between type 2 diabetes and both hepatocellular carcinoma and pancreatic cancer in both men and women. And in fact, pancreatic cancer was associated with diabetes before we even knew what caused diabetes and before we'd even discovered insulin. And so these are, you can see, essentially have very high risks over twofold increased risk of liver cancer and uh, a 1.8-fold increased risk of pancreatic cancer in people who have diabetes. The other types of tumors listed here have closer to one to two-fold increased risk in people who have diabetes. You can see endometrial cancer, which is strongly associated with, di with obesity, has a risk of about two-fold. And the exception to the rule here is prostate cancer, which you can see actually has a decreased risk of developing prostate cancer in people who have diabetes. However, if you develop prostate cancer and have diabetes, there's an increased mortality. And so physiologically, um, in the research that we do, we, we look at the links between hyperinsulinemia and dyslipidemia specifically with cancer growth. So type 2 diabetes and obesity are not just um, diseases of hyperglycemia, um, but they also have a lot of other things going on from inflammation in the adipose tissue. There's changes in uh, bioavailable estrogens with changes in sex hormone binding globulins. There's changes in leptin and resistance um, and decrease in adiponectin levels, these adipokines. There's also changes in insulin, so both conditions are associated with insulin resistance and elevated insulin levels. And then um, there are also changes in the gut microbiome, which may also influence cancer growth. And so when we think of hyperinsulinemia, we think of both the direct effects of insulin on insulin receptors and tumor growth, which is a large part of our research, um, we also think of indirect effects of insulin because it alters insulin-like growth factor binding proteins, and this may increase levels of free IGF-1 in the circulation and locally around the tumors, and this can increase tumor growth through the IGF-1 receptor. And then the other part of our research is basically looking at dyslipidemia, which is associated with type 2 diabetes and how that can affect cancer growth. So a lot of the research behind this I'm not really going to discuss today, but just to look at the development of type 2 diabetes and why there may be an increased risk of cancer associated with hyperinsulinemia. So we usually diagnose diabetes somewhere after this red line on the right-hand side here when either people have developed frank hyperglycemia and are symptomatic or through screening with hemoglobin A1Cs or fasting glucose where people have hyperglycemia. But what we know is for at least 10 years before the development of frank hyperglycemia, there's a period of time where people have abnormal metabolism in this pre-diabetes phase. So clinically, we can pick this up with hemoglobin A1Cs that are in the pre-diabetic range. 
And if you actually do HOMA IR testing on these people, you'll see that a lot of these patients are insulin resistant. And so in breast cancer, at least, this period of pre-diabetes has been associated with an increase in breast cancer recurrence and a decrease in overall survival. And so this is a study from Pamela Goodwin, who's in uh, Canada. And so what they did was take people who did not have diabetes but had newly diagnosed breast cancer. They measured their fasting insulin levels and then divided them into quartiles based on the fasting insulin level. And they found that the people who had the highest fasting insulin levels had the greatest uh, risk of recurrence after diagnosis of breast cancer. And so this suggests that hyperinsulinemia in the pre-diabetes phase may be associated with an increased risk of cancer growth. And playing into this story is the story of metformin, which is the only drug I'm just going to briefly talk about that treats diabetes that may be beneficial for people with cancer. So metformin actually reduces um, insulin levels in people with diabetes, and so we use it to treat uh, insulin resistance. In people who have uh, stage 4 lung cancer, this is a study done by Jenny Lin here, and so what she found was that when you take all people with uh, stage 4 lung cancer, and she retrospectively went back and looked at people who were treated with metformin or not. And she uh, scored them so that she was equally likely to include people who were at risk, who would have qualified for metformin treatment versus those who wouldn't. And what she found was the people who were treated with metformin actually had a greater survival than people who were not treated with metformin, suggesting that insulin may, the previous study suggested insulin may increase tumor growth, and then in certain tumors, reducing insulin levels may actually benefit survival. So then, what about hyperglycemia? So the other side of diabetes that we're usually used to dealing with is rather, the, rather than the pre-diabetic phase is actually the hyperglycemia. And so in multiple myeloma, they, which has very high rates of hyperglycemia due to the high rate of steroid use, there's a fair amount of evidence that having hyperglycemia actually worsens uh, prognosis. And so in people who have diabetes versus people who don't have diabetes, there's a decreased survival in this red line here in the diabetic population. And in people who are treated with steroids and just have steroid-induced diabetes, they actually have a similarly poor prognosis than people who um, had pre-existing diabetes. And if you look at the actual fasting glucose levels, those who had a mean fasting glucose of less than 120 did better than those who had a hyperglycemia of greater than 1. 120, and those who had more severe hyperglycemia with a max glucose of greater than 200 did worse than those who were less than 200, suggesting that it's hyperglycemia as well as hyperinsulinemia may contribute to tumor progression. And in different cancers, this is in breast cancer, which is a longer survival. Um, patients who initially had baseline A1Cs in, um, in these ranges, basically ranging from normal hemoglobin A1Cs up to hemoglobin A1C of 11, you see that the survival was much worse in those who had higher hemoglobin A1Cs. And just to remind us all, because sometimes I think we forget what the, the correlation between A1C and blood sugars are, essentially if you have a hemoglobin A1C of 8, that's a mean, fasting, or a mean plasma glucose of 183. And so people, once they went over 7.5, there was really a significant upslope in the um, rate of mortality. And so again, this suggests over the long term, having hyperglycemia is poor for survival. Again, um, this is again looking at tighter glycemic control, and so in people who had hemoglobin A1Cs in fact greater than 7%, actually had a much worse survival over a 10-year follow-up period than people who had A1Cs in the well, what we would consider well-controlled diabetes range of less than 6.5, or those between 6.5 and 6.9. And so th there's actually a three-fold increased risk of mortality over uh, time in people who had baseline A1Cs that were um, greater than 7. And then this study was done by um, one of the medical students here with Dr. O. Um, and essentially this looked at people who had castration-resistant prostate cancer <coughs> progression. And so these were people who were initially diagnosed who did not have uh, bone metastases but did have diabetes. And what he found was that over time those who did not have diabetes were slower to progress to castration-resistant prostate cancer than those who had diabetes. And even in cancers that we sort of think of as having a poor prognosis, such as pancreatic cancer, in those who actually have resectable disease, so less severe, presumably, pancreatic cancer, having diabetes is actually associated with a worse prognosis. In people who had unresectable pancreatic cancer from this meta-analysis, there's no difference in prognosis in the people who had diabetes and did not have diabetes. So essentially what I'm showing you is that diabetes is associated with a worse prognosis 
in many different cancers, and it seems that poorly controlled diabetes with hyperglycemia is, um, increases that risk of poor <coughs> prognosis. And what about the short-term complications? So what I've shown you so far is, is mortality, but what about morbidity and diabetes? And so we tend to think less about this because generally when we're treating diabetes, we're treating a disease that we think of as progressing over many, many years, causing retinopathy and nephropathy, which we think of as long-term complications of diabetes. So in actual fact, there are some short-term complications of having hyperglycemia in patients with cancer. And this is generally poorly described in the literature and it's kind of an emerging area. And so this study was done by Amir Steinberg here in hematology. And what they found in this study of 619 patients who had blood sugars checked, and this was done the week before admission to hospital with, for stem cell transplant, they divided them into groups based on their glycemic control. Um, group number two, which is a red line here, basically had good glucose control to start with and remained in normal glycemic ranges. You can see the other groups started normal and increased or started high and basically remained high. And what they found was as regards length of stay in the hospital after stem cell transplant, the group with the normal blood sugars actually had uh, the shortest length of stay and they had the lowest readmission rates at 90 days post-discharge. So this suggests that it's not just long-term hyperglycemia that's bad, but short-term hyperglycemia may actually affect prognosis in these patients too. And there are other, so what, I mean, what would cause people to have higher readmission rates and um, longer length of stay in the hospital? So infection rates um, during initial chemotherapy for multiple myeloma, rates of sepsis during induction chemotherapy for um, ALL, and post-op gynecological infections in people who have uh, diabetes are known to be higher than um, those who don't have diabetes. And you can see the rates of infections increases based on blood sugar levels um, in people with multiple myeloma. Sepsis rates increase in people who are hyperglycemic with um, ALL and post-op infections are increased in people who have diabetes and gynecological cancers. There's very little actually in the literature on these rates of hyperglycemia. There's literally single papers on the rates of complications in these um, events, but it, it's not so surprising if you treat diabetes because we know that post-op infections um, in cardiology, people who have um, cardiac bypasses, when they have hyperglycemia, they have much higher rates of sternal wound infections. So it's not entirely a surprise that people who have gynecological cancers should have higher rates of post-op infections. <coughs> and then other things we really don't think about um, very frequently, but actually in people who get chemotherapy, there are high rates of neuropathy. So in taxane therapy specifically, there are um, rates of neuropathy of approximately 18% in people who don't have diabetes. And those who have diabetes, the rates increase to 75%. And then longer term complications, including erectile dysfunction in men who are treated for prostate cancer, the hazard ratio of having, or the odds ratio of having um, erectile dysfunction if you have diabetes versus not is 2.6. So in addition to the increase in mortality, there is an increase in morbidity in people who have diabetes and hyperglycemia who have cancer. Cachexia then is an important um, prognostic indicator in people who have cancer. So once people start losing weight, muscle and fat mass, their prognosis declines. And especially in pancreatic cancer, a lot of people will die with cancer cachexia. Diabetes is, um, has not really been well described to be, or, sorry, diabetes and cancer has not been well described to be associated with cachexia, but there is one study which is very recent um, just showing that there is a significantly greater loss of both visceral adipose tissue and also of muscle mass in people who have diabetes versus people who don't have diabetes. And they didn't dissect this further to see if the people who had diabetes had greater hyperglycemia or if there were subsets within the group. The numbers were relatively small, but overall it sort of suggests what I think we see clinically in that people who have diabetes are more likely to lose <coughs> both, both visceral adipose tissue and muscle. Sorry. <clears throat> so basically the morbidity from diabetes and hyperglycemia can be thought of as um, have people having more weight loss and more muscle weakness, which is associated with cancer cachexia, greater risk of infections, potentially greater post-operative complications, greater risks of neuropathy, and greater sexual dysfunction. And then other things that I think are associated with diabetes from seeing people in the clinic are greater rates of dehydration due to hyperglycemia, potentially greater risks of fractures because we know that fractures are associated with diabetes and fractures are associated with certain cancers, risks of depression 
which um, we frequently see in people with diabetes more than the general population and is, I suspect, again, higher in people who have diabetes and cancer than people who have cancer alone. And then also um, rates of electrolyte uh, abnormalities. So hypomagnesemia is common in people on platinum-based therapies, um, and hyperglycemia can worsen this hypomagnesemia. But a lot of these complications are really not recognized as side effects of having hyperglycemia and diabetes in addition to cancer. Additionally, in patients who have neuropathy, for example, it, it also adds another problem to the management of the diabetes. So you have hyperglycemia, you have painful neuropathy in your fingers, getting somebody to actually check their blood sugars in that situation can be very difficult. And so the things play kind of in both directions in that diabetes can worsen the complications and the complications can in turn lead to worsened diabetes control. So what actually happens when people are diagnosed with cancer and their diabetes control? So this is, again, a, a pretty understudied area. Um, but what we do see is that metformin adherence actually decreases in women who are diagnosed with breast cancer. And breast cancer is usually not a short-term fatal disease. It's usually what we think of the survival in breast cancer relative to a lot of other cancers is very good. But what actually happens related to the, um, the time when people are diagnosed with cancer and undergoing their treatment period, you can see that the adherence rates, and this is basically percent who are greater than 80% adherent, the adherence rates drop dramatically around the treatment period. And this you could consider as many reasons and that the patients could have diarrhea or other reasons why they can't take the metformin. But basically once it drops, it stays low for up to three years after the patients are diagnosed with breast cancer. And usually, again, the treatment doesn't necessarily, the chemotherapy won't go on for three years. And so basically once the adherence drops, it stays low for a long period of time. And they didn't follow up this study long enough to know exactly when the adherence improves. But what they did look at over the same period of time was the hemoglobin A1Cs. And so again, whereas in the beginning, prior to the, start, prior to the diagnosis of cancer, 65% of these patients had hemoglobin A1Cs of less than 7%, it dropped to less than 50% and stayed low for three years after they were diagnosed with cancer, suggesting that people who have cancer diagnosed have worsening um, diabetes control, and it doesn't improve rapidly after they're finished their chemotherapy. So what does this mean for the patient? So again, as I said, there's really a lack of literature on how diabetes control um, is generally affected by a cancer diagnosis. And in a lot of these patients, like the breast cancer patients, what we saw was there were 10-year follow-up. So these people are living for at least 10 years or longer after their cancer diagnosis. And so we know from the diabetes um, and complication trials that essentially People who have um, better control, it stands to them over the years. So this is um, one of the landmark diabetes trials where they put people into the intensive treatment group and the conventional treatment group. And they found over time that those who had um, the intensive therapies had less rates of retinopathy and nephropathy and neuropathy after the completion of the initial DCCT trial. And basically over follow-up over the years, those who had the initial intensive therapy did better long-term. And interestingly, in this trial, people who had type 1 diabetes who were in that intensive treatment group had rates of cancer mortality of 16.3% um, versus those in the conventional treatment group had a higher cancer mortality. And so it sort of begs the question, at least in people who have breast cancer diagnosis, is this going to cause some legacy effects? So if people are diagnosed with breast cancer, their diabetes control gets worse for we know at least three years after the diagnosis. By undertreating these people who have cancer at the time and by the slow catch up to improve their diabetes control over the years, will they actually have this good or bad legacy effect where those who have poor glycemic control at the time actually will do worse in follow up? Okay, this didn't work. So the, so the ADA guidelines currently say that for people um, who basically have a good prognosis and who are going to uh, do well, you should target the A1C to less than 6.5%. Um, essentially in people who are older or people who have um, an intermediate lifespan, um, which is basically pres uh, presumed by the doctor who's treating them, the A1C goal is usually less than 7%. And then people who are deemed to have a poor prognosis have an A1C goal of less than uh, 8%. And so the thing is that generally um, who determines that A1C goal is it's generally the physician, the diabetes doctor who's treating the patient, and also with the patient and what they think when they look at the patient. And so I think overall as an endocrinologist, we sort of don't think a lot of the time of 
the actual prognosis of the patients. We, we think of what we think is the prognosis for the patients, and we think we know how long the patient is, is likely to survive and how sick they look to us right now. And so sometimes when I see the people who, have, who are undergoing chemotherapy, I often think this person looks very, very ill and you know, I should just back off and not kind of pressurize them too much with the diabetes. But in actual fact, I feel like there's, because the area is generally understudied, we may not actually be doing our patients favors in the long term. <clears throat> so this kind of led to basically the startup of this onco-endocrinology clinic. And so as mentioned at the beginning, I basically see patients on Fridays at the FPA in the morning and the CAM building in the afternoon to treat patients specifically who have cancer and have endocrine and diabetes problems. And this is just an idea, of, it's just a subset of the patients um, I looked at to see what kind of um, cancers these patients have. So a large number of the patients I'm seeing are from the multiple myeloma group here and another subset are coming from the um, hematological cancers, leukemias. Um, it's not a normal distribution of cancer prevalence within the population because, as you can see, an, um, another chunk of them come from pancreatic cancer groups and neuroendocrine tumors. And this is just basically related to the people who are most likely to develop hyperglycemia and the drugs they're being treated with for their cancer and how that contributes to hyperglycemia. Um, just kind of for my own interest, I looked at people who had pre-existing diabetes and people who had pre-existing type 1 and type 2. And this is essentially a typical distribution of the population. 5% of the patients have type 1 diabetes. Um, the remainder have type 2 diabetes. And people, this is when I asked, actually, sorry, this is when I looked back through the chart to see who had pre-existing diabetes, no matter what they told me when they came to see me. So some people said they never had diabetes before. When you look back, they had A1Cs of 7, 2, and 3 years earlier. So people who um, really had uh, new type 2 diabetes were 30%. People who had pre-existing diabetes were actually 50%. And, um, sorry, this chunk here were the 15% who previously knew they had diabetes in the past. And then, um, how high were the blood sugars when they come? So I realize that this is not the typical collection of patients who have diabetes and cancer. This is the extreme. But essentially, the people who I see, 7% um, of them were referred with hypoglycemia. And this was um, patients who, a few patients who ended up in the emergency department with hypoglycemia. Um, including people who were discharged on tapering doses of prednisone. The insulin was continued and the patient became hypoglycemic um, after the prednisone came off, but because they were still taking their insulin. Only 10% of the patients had blood sugars of less than 200 when they were referred. And essentially everybody else was somewhere over 200. 5% um, were over, I mean, I think this group here, if you're 20%, if you're over 450 or over 540, it doesn't make that much difference. But basically, there were some severely hyperglycemic patients. And really what triggered the, um, the referral a lot of the time was a hospital admission with hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia, patients who had symptomatic hyperglycemia. So a lot of people come, obviously, with blood sugars of 3, 4, 500, who have weight loss, who have um, blurred vision, who have polyuria, polydipsia, and think it's all side effects to their chemotherapy. Um, People who've lost a lot of weight, people who've lost 30 pounds in weight, just again thinking it's their cancer, but in actual fact it's undiagnosed diabetes. Um, radiology in certain places will refuse to do the PET CT scans when the glucose is over 180. And so hyperglycemia that prevents um, a CT PET scan is also another reason that people get referred. And then a lab alert. So if the blood sugar is 540 and the lab calls the physician to say that, they, um, that the blood sugar is high, they usually will also get a referral. The question is like, why were so many people so hyperglycemic? And I think a lot of the time when you look back through the chart, the blood sugars are taking around 200 for a long period of time, but it just doesn't really raise any alert. And a lot of the time patients, when they go to the oncologist and they start seeing the oncologist and getting chemotherapy very frequently, they kind of fall out of touch with their primary care doctor, at least for a period of time. And so <coughs> they really aren't seeing, a lot of the notes will say, you know, followed by primary care physician for management of diabetes. But in fact, the patient is now here and they live out in Long Island or upstate somewhere, and they're really actually not seeing their primary care physician for the management of the diabetes, and it just gets out of control. Or the people don't check their blood sugar because they had a history of type 2 diabetes or prediabetes, and the risk of developing hyperglycemia with whatever treatment they were put on wasn't really um, predicted. Um, so these are the treatments then that led to hyperglycemia. So the vast majority of people and the reason that a lot of the patients I'm seeing are coming from the hematological malignancies are because they get very high doses of steroids, either um, 
on, after bone marrow transplants or as part of their treatment for multiple myeloma, they frequently get high doses of dexamethasone. Other groups um, are pancreatic, and this I've put down to include um, basically people who had partial or complete pancreatectomies, androgen deprivation therapy in people with prostate cancer, and then things that affect insulin secretion, mostly somatostatin analogs, um, and things that affect insulin signaling, which are some of the new targeted therapies I'll talk about in a minute, and then basically a combination of immune therapies and um, steroids with other things that inhibit insulin signaling. So then um, the second part I'm just going to talk about, to the, uh, about how cancer and cancer treatments can affect diabetes. So the mechanisms through which um, cancer treatments can cause diabetes, I really think of as two arms to this. One is therapies that will decrease insulin secretion, and the second is therapies that will increase insulin resistance. And this is not every cancer therapy, it's just the ones that I most commonly see from the previous list um, that are commonly causing hyperglycemia in our patients. So glucocorticoids, um, commonly used in the hematological malignancies and also in a lot of patients who um, are taking dexamethasone for nausea after they have been, um, after they're getting chemotherapy. Um, androgen deprivation therapy is more of a chronic um, hyperglycemia in patients with prostate cancer. So somatostatin analogs are generally used for people with neuroendocrine tumors, both secreting and non-secreting. These tyrosine kinase inhibitors and AKT and mTOR inhibitors are the targeted uh, therapies that are more widely being used now for different cancers. And then more recently in the last few years, we've been seeing patients on immune therapies. <clears throat> so just to talk about um, how insulin regulates your blood sugar, just before I get into the, the signaling and the targeted therapies. So essentially, if you eat something, and your blood sugar goes up, there's two ways to get your blood sugar down. One is that your pancreas will make insulin, and this will reduce your blood sugar. For patients in the hospital, we sometimes give them insulin, or people with diabetes, they get insulin, and their blood sugar comes down. Sometimes what happens is your blood sugar goes up, either your pancreas makes insulin, or we give, in, or we give insulin injections, and nothing much happens. And in this case, um, the glucose more or less stays the same, and we consider this insulin resistance. So basically, um, this is just to think of how, based, how um, insulin can regulate blood sugar. So from a signaling point of view, this is the same thing, but it's just looking at essentially how insulin brings down the blood sugar. So when insulin, you either give it or your pancreas makes insulin, it binds to the insulin receptor. And the type of receptor that is is a tyrosine kinase receptor. This is important because there are a family of similar receptors to insulin, like insulin-like growth factor, EGF receptor um, that are all very similar in their um, nature. When insulin binds to the insulin receptor, it causes glucose uptake through this glucose transporter, GLUT4, in skeletal muscle and in adipose tissue. And basically, there's a stepwise pathway that gets from the insulin receptor to GLUT4, which includes these two steps that I've highlighted. One is PI3 kinase, which is a protein kinase, which is an enzyme. Um, that causes activation of the pathway. And the second step that I've highlighted here is AKT, which is another protein that gets activated by phosphorylation and leads to this cascade that causes glucose uptake. So the main effects of um, insulin physiologically are that it increases glycogen synthesis, so it increases the storage <coughs> of glycogen in the liver. It increases the glucose uptake, like I just showed in the previous picture, into skeletal muscle and adipose tissue. It increases protein synthesis, so um, insulin is an anabolic hormone, and it increases lipogenesis. It then decreases glycogenolysis um, and gluconeogenesis, so it decreases glucose output from the liver. It decreases ketogenesis, so this is why when people are insulin deficient, they get ketoacidosis. It decreases proteolysis, or the breakdown of ad um, amino acids and proteins, and it decreases lipolysis, or the breakdown of fat. <coughs> So this is why it makes sense to me that people who are insulin deficient and hyperglycemic get cachexia and a decrease in fat and muscle when they um, become hyperglycemic and they have cancer. And so glucocorticoids um, basically induce diabetes through insulin resistance and hyperglycemia. So there are many aspects of glucocorticoids and usually physiologically we think mostly of the insulin resistance effects. So it increases glucose output from the liver it decreases glucose uptake, so when you give that dose of insulin and you don't see the blood sugar come down, it's because it's basically a reduction in the glucose uptake. Um, and this occurs into both skeletal muscle and adipose tissue. Additionally, when, when you give people glucocorticoids, they'll tell you that they have hyperphagia. So the glucocorticoids act on the brain as well and simulate appetite. 
And so through all of these mechanisms, people who are on high doses of steroids for a long period of time basically have decreased glucose uptake, so you see the postprandial hyperglycemia. They also get hyperphagia, so they're, and they often can't sleep at night because they're a little hyperactive. So they basically are up eating late at night, and then this, this potentiates the hyperglycemia you see with steroids. They can also get a decrease in beta cell secretion, so they can sometimes actually be insulin deficient as well. Androgen deprivation therapy we then generally think of as more of a chronic, it doesn't cause hyperglycemia in the same way that glucocorticoids will, it's more of a chronic effect. And so over time, um, there's an increase in visceral adiposity in people who are on androgen deprivation therapy, and this will lead to an increase in the rate of diabetes. Um, this is one of the landmark studies basically first showing this increased rate of diabetes in people who, have, who are taking androgen deprivation therapy. So we see over time that people on androgen deprivation therapy have greater visceral adiposity, increased rates of diabetes, they have a dyslipidemic profile, and they have greater risks of um, cardiovascular disease. Somatostatin receptor analogs are not, you probably don't see them so commonly. They're usually given um, for neuroendocrine tumors. Classically, they're given, they used to be given for the secreting neuroendocrine tumors to um, reduce the symptoms that pe people would get from these neuroendocrine tumors. But more recently, they were also approved for the treatment of um, non-secreting neuroendocrine tumors. And these basically work um, by acting on the somatostatin receptor on the tumors, and this decreases tumor growth, um, reduces cell proliferation, and reduces the survival of cells. Interestingly, if you like insulin signaling, basically the somatostatin receptor um, activation will also inhibit insulin signaling and IGF-1 receptor signaling, which is also thought to be a secondary benefit of these um, somatostatin receptor an uh, analogs. And so essentially they cause activation of phosphatases, and the phosphatases do the opposite of the kinases in the insulin receptor signaling pathway, and will reduce signaling through the IGF-1 receptor and the insulin receptor. From a physiological point of view, um, we normally think of growth hormone, IGF-1, and insulin being part of a, um, an antagonistic pathway in that growth hormone increases insulin resistance, whereas insulin and IGF-1 have similar effects on insulin signaling. So normally when we have glucose, as I mentioned earlier, you basically get an increase in insulin release from the pancreas. Growth hormone will cause insulin resistance at the liver. Sorry, growth hormone will cause an increase in IGF-1 secretion from the liver. Um, and IGF-1 has similar actions to insulin on the IGF-1 receptor. Growth hormone also, however, causes an increase in gluconeogenesis, so insulin resistance in the liver. And this can actually increase circulating glucose levels. So interestingly, somatostatin analogs can actually have antagonistic effects on growth hormones. So if you give a somatostatin analog, you'll actually get a decrease in uh, systemic growth hormone levels, which will decrease the gluconeogenesis and actually decrease glucose levels. In addition, if you decrease the growth hormone level, you'll get a decrease in IGF-1. And somatostatin analogs will decrease insulin secretion from the pancreas and also cause a decrease in glucagon. So what this generally means is that in, in patients who have, who receive somatostatin analogs, although you get a systemic decrease in insulin resistance by decreasing the growth hormone, and you get the beneficial effects both direct from the somatostatin analogs on the tumor cells by inhibiting that receptor, you can also get benefits by reducing this, the, both the local and the circulating levels of IGF-1 and insulin receptor, which may have pro-growth effects on the tumor but you can also get a decrease in insulin secretion from the pancreas, which can cause hyperglycemia. So more recently, there have been um, a number of targeted therapies that are being researched and have been um, approved for the treatment of various cancers. So as I mentioned, insulin is from this family of receptors called these tyrosine kinase receptors. And in this family, there's um, a group of other members. Um, so there are EGF receptor, which is overexpressed or mutated in a number of cancers. Um, probably most famously HER2, so there are HER2 targeted therapies in breast cancer. And then there are a number of others, including um, the VEGF receptor, the um, PDGF receptor, FGF receptor, and these are all receptors that are important in cancers. When you activate the insulin receptor, this is the part I showed you with the pathway earlier, where you get an increase in glucose uptake. In actual fact, it activates other um, proteins as well, not just those that increase glucose uptake. So if you activate um, glycogen synthesis, 
it's through a different protein, this GSK3 beta, and the fact that it causes an increase in um, protein synthesis is through a protein called mTOR1. These are highlighted because basically AKT, PI3 kinase, and mTORC1 are, um, now have targeted therapy um, for the treatment of cancer. And so these are the approved medications that are currently in clinical use um, for the treatment of various cancers. Um, this group are VEGF receptor inhibitors, um, and they target the VEGF receptor. However, because of the similarity between the VEGF receptor, the tyrosine kinase receptors, and the insulin receptor, depending on the specificity of the drug, it can often cause an inhibition of insulin receptor signaling as well and lead to insulin resistance. And this can lead to hyperglycemia. There is one approved PI3 kinase um, inhibitor at present, although there are many more in clinical trials. And again, if you inhibit PI3 kinase, the rates of hyperglycemia are approximately 20 to 25%, depending on the clinical trials. These drugs have not yet been approved, but there are AKT inhibitors that are also in clinical use. And again, the rates of hyperglycemia tend to be somewhere around 20% um, in people who are receiving these drugs. mTOR inhibitors are in clinical use um, for hepatocellular carcinomas and for neuroendocrine tumors. And these drugs inhibit mTOR which, again, will cause an insulin resistance and impair insulin signaling and lead to hyperglycemia. This um, is a table that I received from uh, Dr. Chari in hematology, and it was actually a paper that was written by one of the residents here. Um, and so this is just a summary of the upcoming um, novel targeted therapies in multiple myeloma. And the ones I've highlighted um, are the AKT inhibitor, the tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Um, so these two we know already can cause hyperglycemia. Last week we saw a patient on, in a clinical trial on this XPO, uh, XPO1 inhibitor, which is um, exportin, which also is very downstream in the insulin signaling pathway, but it also may be associated with hyperglycemia. HDAC inhibitors I'm not going to discuss today, but this is a new class of agents that are being investigated um, for cancer treatment that may actually improve insulin resistance, and so may actually be beneficial in people who are diabetic and have cancer. And then the final group that are done here are the immune therapies, so the PD-1 inhibitors. So just finally, the PD-1 inhibitors are basically immune therapies, and these were first approved um, for the treatment of uh, melanoma, metastatic melanoma. So the first drug was um, ipilimumab that was approved in 2011. And these were uh, revolutionary drugs for the treatment of melanoma because they increased the two-year survival rate from 14 to 24%. Nivolumab and pembrolizumab are PD-1 inhibitors, um, and these were approved in 2014 and increased the five-year survival um, with nivolumab treatment up to 35%. And then more recently, um, the FDA have approved the concurrent treatment with ipilimumab and nivolumab um, for the treatment of metastatic yeah. melanoma. And this basically increases the survival rates or the response rates further up to 57.6%. These drugs, pembrolizumab and nivolumab, um, the PD-1 inhibitors, are now approved for a, a, an enlarging number of, of different types of cancer, including non-small cell lung cancer, head and neck squamous cell carcinoma, um, renal cell cancer, and Hodg uh, classic Hodgkin lymphoma. And these drugs um, we're seeing more and more in the clinic and are, have interesting side effects. So you can see when you do the combination of therapy, you get a response rate of 57.6%, but in actual fact, when you do the combination therapy, you can see that the uh, toxicities also increase. So in people who are in nivolumab alone, you get toxicity rates of 43.5%. When you give uh, ipilimumab alone, you get a toxicity of 55.6%. When you combine the two together, you actually get a increase in toxicity of 68.7%. So although you've improved the response rate, the toxicity is also um, increased. And from an endocrine perspective, um, the most common of these um, toxicities is hypothyroidism. And although there are very few um, grade three or four cases, which is basically severe requiring hospitalization cases of hypothyroidism, um, it is well recognized. And so about 15%, um, depending on the study, somewhere between 10 and 20% uh, of patients treated with these drugs will develop hypothyroidism. Um, the mechanism of action is essentially that they um, will get the patient's own immune uh, system to essentially fight the cancer. And so the tumor cells secrete these PD-1 and have uh, CTLA-4 receptors, 
And these essentially cause the tumor to live without an immune response um, being generated by the host. So when you give these drugs, you get this, the patient's own T cells to respond. And they act in two different places, the priming phase, which is the CTLA-4 of the immune response, and the T cell um, interaction with the cancer cells. And so the theory in giving the two drugs together is that you're basically hitting the T cell response in two different places. So interestingly, although hypothyroidism, as I mentioned, is the most common of the um, endocrine autoimmune complications of these diseases, type 1 diabetes has also been associated with anti-PD-1 therapy. And so this is um, interesting. It's basically giving us a new population of type 1 diabetes. And although it's still relatively rare, there are an ever-increasing number of case reports of new onset of insulin-deficient type 1 diabetes in older patients treated with these drugs. So this is one of the first reports, um, which is from the group in Yale, it was in Diabetes Care in 2015, where they had five patients, all in their 50s up to 80s, who were treated with um, nivolumab, which is one of the PD-1 inhibitors, or pembrolizumab, um, which is the CTLA-4 inhibitor. And within the period of one month to five months of starting the therapy, they essentially um, developed hyperglycemia. And here are the blood sugars. You can see the blood sugars were somewhere between uh, up to 500. And although some of the patients developed DKA, um, some of the patients just had hyperglycemia. And they all had low uh, C-peptide levels, showing that they were insulin deficient. Three of the five patients had autoantibodies that were positive for immune cells. Um, two of the patients didn't. And then they've been looking at um, HLA subtypes of these patients to see if they can identify which patients are more likely. And four of the five patients had HLA DR4, which is one of the HLA subtypes that's associated with autoimmune diabetes. And so this um, has more recently made it to the New York Times. Um, so this was from the group in Yale. And um, they documented these cases from the Yale group that um, developed <coughs> hyperglycemia and new onset type 1 diabetes. And interestingly, the patient at the bottom here said, I can deal with diabetes if I beat melanoma. So this is sort of the attitude of a lot of people. Um, type 1 diabetes is not a fun disease, but um, you have to inject, obviously, insulin multiple times a day. But a lot of people, the trade-off of developing diabetes sounds less scary than um, potentially dying from melanoma. So to conclude, so essentially, um, diabetes is associated with an increased risk of developing many cancers. Uh, diabetes is associated also with an increase in mortality, and what we often forget is there's an increase in morbidity in patients who have diabetes and cancer. There are many emerging targeted therapies that um, increase the risk of developing hyperglycemia, and for us, we need to be aware of the fact that these drugs may increase, increase the risk of hyperglycemia and to prevent people ending up in the hospital with hyperglycemia. Um, from my point of view, I would recommend that if any of the people are being started on these drugs, they should have screening A1Cs and fasting glucose is checked and regular monitoring to make sure that they don't develop symptoms from hyperglycemia um, and end up being admitted for something that, in theory, should be preventable. We also need to be more aware of hypoglycemia in people who are on steroids. We need to know that when we taper those steroids, patients should also taper their insulin. And um, we need further studies, really, to understand the impact of improving diabetes control in these patients. So whether actually reducing that A1C will actually reduce these risks of complications and reduce potentially the cancer-associated morbidity and mortality. And with that, I would just like to thank um, a few people. So mainly my mentor, since I've come to Mount Sinai, who is Derek Leroy, who's here. Um, and then other people who I think of as collaborators and supporters who've helped me um, over the last number of years. The funding that I have, which is um, from the KOH, which is actually for basic science research, looking at the uh, links between lipids and uh, breast cancer. The Tisch Cancer Institute and the Department of Medicine, who have also supported me since I've been here. And then finally, if you found this interesting, we have a Diabetes and Cancer Symposium coming up on April 7th, which essentially is going to be mostly clinically looking at these links between diabetes and cancer. We have some great speakers coming in from outside, as well as some of our own internal people. Thank you. The concern I have is that uh, we may possibly conclude that tight control of diabetes in people with diabetes and cancer may, may be a good thing. Um, and there's a lot of data to suggest that at least for coronary disease that it may not be. Um, 
the randomized control trials, advanced court, et cetera. So is there data that you can mine from those studies that could help you predict whether tight control would be detrimental to cancer patients who have diabetes from the existing randomized control trials, or do you have to embark upon a new one to show that? So um, thank you for that question. So I, it's an interesting question. I've looked back through those studies, and I think one thing is that from the point of view of um, cancer, they're actually all underpowered to look at that question, which is the big problem. So they were powered to look at cardiovascular disease, and so the outcomes from cancer were basically all neutral. But there, there was no increase in cancer, but there was no, uh, there was no beneficial effect either. So I think it's a difficult question to ask because, again, the, the thing, I mean, one thing that I see from a clinical kind of take home is that a lot of these patients, it's not about tight control, it's just about control. So a lot of these people are just poorly controlled with diabetes, and that's clearly bad for them from many perspectives. So I think the first step would just be to try and get better control to the normal targets of people with diabetes. And then, then we could think about kind of whether better or within those ranges of what we now consider targets, we could then consider you know, fine tuning it. Emily, so in the last few slides, you're talking about the side effects of some of the newer therapies um, and causing a bit, uh, new diabetes. But the old therapies have a lot of side effects as well. So how does it stack up? Is it the same amount of people or and it's just a different mechanism or do we have any data yet? Um, I mean, so, so, it's, so far, the, the majority of patients who have hyperglycemia, I think, are still related to steroids, the old tried and tested. It, it works very well for inducing hyperglycemia, and there's more people still getting steroids than there are getting these new drugs. I think the severity of hyperglycemia from steroids that I've seen is also more severe. Mostly, these, the patients on the newer drugs tend to be less hyperglycemic, and the patterns of hyperglycemia are quite different when you see the patients, but it hasn't, again, been, been so well worked out. Um, the newer drugs, the PD-1 therapies and the immune therapies, are pr potentially more concerning because they're getting used in a wider and wider group of people, and they're causing insulin deficiency that's not reversible. At least if you stop the steroids, the hyperglycemia goes away. If you take away somebody's beta cells, they're not getting them back. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Age is a powerful factor in your patients and in the uh, pancreatic uh, tumors. Have you been looking at that, or have your colleagues been looking at the strong impact of age uh, in these tumors? Um, so, uh, you mean the links between diabetes and, and cancer in age in those patients, or the links between diabetes control? Well, I meant age and the prevalence and the impact of the pancreatic cancers, especially the uh, exocrine. Uh. <coughs> so um, the, the link between diabetes and cancer as regards the incidence in age is, is independent of age, as in if you have diabetes, the link with pancreatic cancer is independent of, of patient's age. As one of the, the things, I mean, one of the links between diabetes and cancer is Obviously, age, as people get older, they're more likely to get diabetes, and as people get older, they're more likely to get cancer. But there seems to be an independent risk between the, an interaction between the two diseases in addition to age. Um, that was actually one of the, the reasons why it was first noticed that there was a link, because it, it seemed like as people were getting older, they, these were two diseases that were becoming more common. Good. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.